All right, as with most things, it's going to make more sense and you're going to learn more by doing this than by just watching videos and listening to me talk about it. So as I go through this example that's in this video, try to do the example by yourself first as much as possible and only move on after you've got some sort of an answer. Even if it's a crazy answer, you'll learn more that way than you will by just watching. Although you'll feel like you're learning by watching, but it will be an illusion. So before we dive in, I do have these suggested steps, as I mentioned in class for hypothesis testing. I suggest you write out the hypothesis first, you draw a diagram and label as much on it as you can, you find a critical statistic and the rejection region or regions. Now I, I have mentioned that it's not, um, that that's not the only way to do things, but I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. Calculate your observed statistic, and that's going to be, in this case, the z-value that goes with your sample mean. Then compare the two, the observed and the critical. Or you can just look up the p-value, or you can get the p-value from software. But doing these examples by hand, we're going to have to dive into t and um, chi-squared and f eventually. And it doesn't make as much sense by hand to just calculate a p-value for reasons that will become clear eventually. So I'm going to go through these examples assuming you're using the critical statistic and rejection regions version of things rather than calculating the p-value itself. So that's what we're going to do. And then finally you need to make a decision about the null hypothesis and state your conclusion about the null hypothesis. Now there's a case to be made that this should be a shorter list or that it should be more zippy and easy to remember. So I suppose you could strip it down to its bare essentials here and you could just take the letters H, D, C, O, C, D, C and make handy mnemonic versions to help you remember all the steps, but that's up to you. So let's dive into this activity. Let's assume that there's a drug company uh, that hears patient reports that bad breath might be a side effect of its drug. And previous report indica research indicates that people's breath stinkiness in general, on average, is a value of 60 on some kind of, kind of standardized bad breath scale, which I made up, with higher values being worse breath, and that the standard deviation of this breath stinkiness is 17.5. So we have uh, a null hypothesis mean value, and we have a standard deviation of the population. So does the drug significantly alter people's breath on average? So write out the hypotheses here. And I'll show you the data, although this doesn't really answer much for you. Let's assume that this is the data that they collect. They get a mean of 73.5. Now there's always a difference. It's higher, of course, than the mean, so at least in this sample, breath was a little bit more stinky while on the drug, but that means uh, basically nothing by itself unless we try and figure out how high that really is, we try and get some sort of understanding of that. So the hypotheses are going to have to come first and then the other steps. So. I sometimes want to stop and do this checklist, just so you kind of have your head straight. What is the sample point estimate? It's the sample mean. What is the sampling distribution of this estimate? <coughs> it's the sampling distribution of the mean. In other words, all possible sample means from n equals 10 from this population, because our sample is n equals 10. What is the mean of that sampling distribution? It's the population mean, according to the null hypothesis. This is a hypothesis test, so our sampling distribution means are always the mean according to the null hypothesis. And what's the standard error? It's the standard deviation of the raw scores divided by the square root of n, which in this case turns out to be 5.53. So writing out the hypotheses. In words, this is how we might write the hypotheses. The null hypothesis is that the drug does not cause a change, which means that the mean value for the sample or for the population that our sample came from should be the same as the mean value for the overall population. In other words, our sample mean is the same, our, our sample mean comes from a, a population that has the same overall mean as mu zero. Another way to say that is our sample comes from the population of mu zero. And then the alternative hypothesis, the drug does cause a change. In other, words, in other words, our sample mean comes from a different population, a population with a different mean from mu zero. And so in symbols, we would write it out this way. Sometimes I put true, true mean, 
a little subscript mu true. I could just say mu, mu meaning the population that our sample came from. And notice it's not equal to because this is a non-directional or two-tailed test because the original research question just asked whether there was a change, not is there an increase or is there a decrease or something like that. And this is how we might set up the diagram. You wouldn't need all these little values, like all the little z values on the bottom. But you definitely should draw a curve, and it needs to be exactly as pretty as this one the computer would draw, drew. Uh, you should put 0 for mu0, zero, or you can put 60 for mu0, which would be a reasonable thing to put. And you should definitely put your alpha divided appropriately, in this case, for a two-tailed alpha or two-tailed test in each tail. So you should get a diagram that looks more or less like this, although like I said, the little green z values on the bottom probably shouldn't be there because that's just a lot to do. Now we can look up our critical value, and all we need is the critical value that cuts off 0.025 in each tail. And if you get this, then you find 0.025 in the middle here, and out here we have negative 1.96. So it's going to be negative and positive 1.96. <coughs> In R, you can do this pretty easily with the Q norm function. You would just type in Q norm 0.025. You don't need the 0 0.025 if you don't really need it. So now we have our diagram set up and we've added something to it. We've added our Z critical values. This is kind of nice. So this is all Z scores here. We don't have any raw scores on this diagram, although sometimes I like to make a row of raw scores of those that I know and a row of Z scores of those that I know and just fill in as I go along. So now we calculate Z observed, which is not terribly difficult. There's the formula for z observed. It's just our sample mean and minus the mean of the null hypothesis over the standard error. So in this case, it's going to be our sample mean 73.5 minus the mean of the, according to the null hypothesis. And our standard error is the original standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So our z observed is 2.44. And if you remember from the last slide, this is going to be statistically significant because this Z score is going to be in the rejection region. There we go. Z observed equals 2.44. And so the area beyond that is P, except there's this little trick which I mentioned in class once uh, or twice. You don't have to remember this. You can stop right here. You can say Z observed is 2.44. That is beyond the Z critical. It's in the rejection region. It's far enough into the tail that we should reject the null hypothesis. You can go straight to decision about the null and say, I reject the null hypothesis. However, um, if you're interested in the technical details behind things, and actually this will make a difference when using SPSS to do certain uh, tests when you want a one-tailed test instead of a two, etc. You need to remember that for a two-tailed test, the P is divided in half, just like the alpha is. So the, if you were to find the actual area beyond 2.44 in the normal curve table, that's only half of P. You have to double it to find the true p-value. Like I said, that doesn't matter because you still reject the null, and that's all we really care about. But if you want all of p, you have to kind of take the mirror image of the 2.44 z-value and put it on the other side and imagine the other half of p being over there. So you have to double the p-value that it looks like at first. You have to make sure p is symmetrical also. And so our decision is we reject the null hypothesis. And we can give, and I'll always ask you for some reason why you reject the null hypothesis, any of the following. Because the absolute value of z observed is greater than absolute value of the critical z and in the right direction, although for a two-tailed test, everything is the right direction. Because z observed falls in the rejection region, that's a good reason. Because p is less than alpha, that's a good reason. All of those work. And then our conclusion has to be something about the original hypotheses, about what we actually believe is going on now. What's our best estimate of what's going on in the population. The new drug does statistically significantly. Now we didn't say the new drug does increase breast stinkiness because we don't know. We in insert this statistically significantly which is like a code word that says according to my hypothesis test. You know, with the hypothesis test that's my best guess. It does statistically significantly increase breath stinkiness. Now you notice what I put after here. We usually put the test statistic in parentheses so this is as if we were to write it in a report, a research report or a class report or something. We put the test statistic in parentheses, and then after that we put whether the p is less than or greater than our alpha, and we put in the alpha, so p is less than 0.05. So that's pretty standard here.
Now, moving on, what if we did not know the population standard deviation? And indeed, we never know the population standard deviation. So from here on out, we're just going to drop Z on its head. We never know the population standard deviation. And the book has some extra rules for when you use um, a Z test versus a T test, but that's basically what I'm talking about. One simple rule for using a Z versus a T, and perhaps the most important one, is if you don't know the population standard deviation, you should use the T distribution instead of the Z distribution. We'll talk more about this later, but for right now, just think that the t-distribution is a family of distributions that are all based on the, normals, the normal curve, but they're not quite normal. They're tweaked a little bit to account for the fact that you don't know the population standard deviation. And the way you do this is exactly the same as with the z, with just one little tweak, and I'll show you. So let's go back through the same situation, same research setup, same data, Except now we're actually going to use this standard deviation down here. We didn't use it before because we had a population estimate of the standard deviation. And the population estimate, if you have it, is usually much better to use than the, standard, than the sample estimate. It's based on much better data and a much broader range of data, right? So we've got this here. And so we write out our hypothesis, etc. Except every time we were going to do something with a Z, now we do it with a T statistic. A T statistic is calculated almost the same way as a Z statistic. There's almost no difference. Um, and we've got everything the same here, except the standard error is calculated slightly differently. We don't put the standard deviation of the population because we don't know it. We put our best estimate, which is the sample standard deviation. And then instead of divided by the square root of n, we divide by the square root of n minus 1. This might look familiar from sample standard deviation, right? So we have our sample standard deviation, and then we divide that by the square root of n minus 1. So we have a different estimate for uh, the standard error now. We have the same null and the same alternative hypothesis. We write them the same way. We set things up pretty much the same, except now we use the t distribution in your textbook. And this distribution is kind of a pain in the butt. It doesn't list all the areas beyond anything. Instead, it tells you you just only have the t's here. You don't have the areas listed anywhere except a few areas listed up here. And so if we've got two tails and alpha is 0.05, then we're going to look something up in this column. Now the n minus 1, that's the degrees of freedom. In this case, n minus 1. We'll talk more about that later. In this case, n minus 1 is the degrees of freedom. So we're going to look up. We have 0.05 and two tails, which is the same as 0.025 and one tail. So that's in this column. So our critical t is bigger. It's not 1.96 anymore. It's 2.26. So we're being punished yet again for not knowing things. It's harder to find a statistically significant difference. We have to go to 2.26 now instead of 1.96 to reject the null hypothesis. And in R, you can do the same thing. There's a QT function. It's the same thing, and you just have to enter the degrees of freedom if you feel like doing this. So now we set this up, and now we have a t critical which is plus, oh, that one on the left should say minus 2.26, which I apparently failed to do there. Anyway, it's a plus and minus 2.26. So it's the same setup, it's just that we calculate a t, and then we look up a t critical. So the t observed is the same as the z observed, it's just that you use that standard error we calculated for the t distribution, not for the z distribution, not for the normal distribution. So we use the standard deviation of our raw scores, not the standard deviation of the population. We use this from the sample instead, and we divide it by the square root of n minus 1, not of n. And so because of that, our, our um, sample standard deviation was actually bigger, and we divide it by a smaller number. So we end up with a much bigger standard error, as we saw before, 6.263. And so our t, observ our t observed is not very big anymore because our denominator was too big. It, it got bigger. Numerator was the same. There's still the difference between the mean and the the sample mean and the null hypothesis mean. So here, the t isn't big enough. So we can just stop and say, fail to reject the null hypothesis, because t does not fall, t observed does not fall beyond t critical. It does not fall in the rejection region. But once again, it's a two-tailed test, so if we really wanted to know the whole p, we'd have to figure out p for one side and double it. Figuring out p with tables is a pain in the butt, because the tables aren't going to tell you. You'd have to find some really fancy tables that tell you all that. But with computers, it's super easy. You can figure it out with R, no sweat or any software program that does that kind of thing.
But this is why I'm saying you use the, t the critical score version of things rather than just looking up p-value and seeing if p is less than 0.05, because you won't be able to look up p-value once we start using t and other distributions, because there aren't tables that include that, because that would take too many pages of your textbook for that to happen. So your decision, you just fail to reject the null hypothesis for the same reasons, except you put t in there instead of z. But in the end, p is greater than alpha. That's all you need to know. You don't know exactly what p is, but you know it's greater than 0.05. So fail to reject that null hypothesis, your conclusion. Now we have to make a different conclusion. The evidence does not suggest that there's a statistically significant difference. Um, and then in the parentheses afterwards, instead of saying z equals something, we say t, and then either as a subscript or in parentheses, we put the degrees of freedom because you always have to put degrees of freedom with t to specify which one it is, but it's the same idea. You put that information there. So next time, I'm going to talk about two means at once.